This is the Camp Iron Mountain Podcast, a place to learn about U.S. military history as told through the stories of service members, military units, and supporting civilians. Join us as we work to preserve their memories for future generations. Welcome, everyone, to the Camp Iron Mountain Podcast. I'm your host, Gabriel Suarez. It's been quite a long time since the last new episode was released. There's been a lot going on in my life that's required me to put my efforts elsewhere. Thus, the podcast was on a bit of a hiatus. But I'm glad to be back and look forward to getting new episodes out. One major thing that'll begin eating up much of my time soon is starting graduate school this upcoming fall. Thus, all new episodes for the foreseeable future will be released monthly. On our newly revamped website, you will soon find supplemental information and stories in our new blog section every couple of weeks. You can find this, all podcast episodes, and a whole host of other information on our website at www.campironmountain.com. Now, an introduction to our guest. Lieutenant Colonel Mohamed Masikboy has had an atypical military career, to say the least. He started off as an enlisted sailor in the U.S. Navy before moving up become a naval officer, and then eventually he transitioned to the U.S. Army, where he continues to serve on active duty. Over his ongoing 22 years of service, Colonel Massacoy has been through his share of great challenges and great successes, some of which he'll share with us during our talk. His interview has been broken up and will be presented over two episodes. First, a disclaimer. The views expressed by Lieutenant Colonel Massacori on this podcast are from his own personal experiences and do not represent the views of the United States Navy, the United States Army, nor do they represent the views of the Department of Defense. And now, on to our interview. Well, we'd like to welcome to the show uh, Lieutenant Colonel Mohamed Massacoy. Mo, how are you doing, my friend? I am doing great, Gabe. Great to be on your show. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, I am so glad to get you on here. It's it's been a while since I I've, I've tried to get you on uh, because you have such a unique story and, and uh, military background, and you know technically you're you're my first Navy guy too since you, you have some time <laughs> in the Navy. So yes. I really wanted to get you on and, and get your story. So uh, first question we kind of start with everyone is like you know okay. where were you born? You know where did you grow up? And what was your kind of general outlook on on the world at this age? So I was uh, born in Houston, Texas. Uh, I was raised in a family of six. I was the oldest. And when I say Houston, Texas, I always have to qualify it with people. Not the nice part of Texas. So it's <laughs> not the nice part of Houston. Southeast Houston, sunny side. Um, a lot of people refer to it as ghetto, but oddly enough, even the ghetto has pockets of nice, lower middle class living. And uh, that's where I stayed. Grew, grew up in a neighborhood called Kennedy Heights and uh, went to Worthing High School. Believe it or not, I was uh, raised as one of Jehovah's Witnesses. <laughs> so <laughs> the, the reason why I mention that is that my general outlook at on the world while I was growing up was that the world was the worst thing in the world. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, But the interesting thing about being one of Jehovah's Witnesses is that, of course, we couldn't serve in the military. But yeah. as long as I can remember, I've always wanted to be in the military. And uh, you, you have G.I. Joe, um, Transformers, Voltron, <laughs> all, all those great 80s uh, TV shows that always had jets and military mm-hmm. people in them. Uh, remember the the Space Shuttle, Top Gun, all those different things. I always associated being a pilot with being in the military. So... Um, I've always, in the back of my mind, wanted to be in the military. So despite the religion that I was raised in um, and our worldview of pretty much, if you're not one of Jehovah's Witnesses, you're, you're a part of the world. I knew it's so, I, it was something that I always wanted to do. And my mom knew that as well. So, uh, <laughs> so how did that come about then? So you said you're kind of influenced by the image of the military from like, you know, popular culture. What influenced you to take that next step and actually join? 
Well, it was a confluence of events. You know, I was really, you know, I was really floundering around in college. It was funny because I was valedictorian in my senior class. So obviously I'm going to be something important, right? So uh, I was pretty much trying to strike the balance between Jehovah's Witnesses not wanting me to go to college and me not doing the military. So I tried to just, I, I had like four or five different majors in mm-hmm. two different universities over five years. <laughs> so <laughs> I, it was funny. I wanted to be a pharmacist. I wanted to be a mathematician. I was going to be a historian or I was going to be a musician. And finally, when I settled on, okay, I'm just going to be a teacher, all of my scholarships had run out. And I was in my fifth year of school and I was getting to the point in your teachers, um, in the teacher education track where I was going to have to, you know, go to um, do work study. So I was going to have to work as a teacher without getting paid. And I couldn't Mm -hmm. afford to do that. So I felt like, you know, if I joined, if I joined the military, got into the right field and I could finish my degree. I could go into something that interested me and hopefully become a pilot somehow. So, okay. Um, so I was that working. was your ultimate goal was to be a pilot? Well, yeah, get my degree, uh, do something in aviation. I knew I was behind because I graduated in 94. I know all the people in my cohort would have been like in the class of 98 or something like that. So, I just felt like if I kind of I enlisted, I could energize my career and uh, become an officer and everything. But, um, it didn't happen okay. as fast <laughs> as I thought it would. <laughs> All right. So uh, how did, uh, did you choose the Navy then over like, I guess, the Air Force or the Army who both had aviation? <laughs> so long story short, I had a brief, brief stint in the Air Force. <laughs> <laughs> a brief stint in the Air Force. I was actually at Air Force boot camp back in 1995, but they diagnosed me with sickle cell blood trait. And they said, well, sign this paper and you get a waiver. You uh, waive the Air Force's, um, what is that? Waive their liability if I died in mm-hmm. boot camp. And I was like, what? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> they say, well, with the sickle cell blood trait, you stand a 10% chance of dying. Well, I was like, well, screw that. <laughs> so <laughs> I was in the Air Force for less than two weeks. And then I came back home. But by the time that in 1999, I've been in college for like four more years and I realized I still wanted to do it. I was working two jobs and going to school full time when I ran into a Navy recruiter at two o'clock in the morning. At a Taco Cabana in South in Southwest Houston, can't make this stuff up. <laughs> and uh, really nice guy, and he was like, "You know what? Let's go ahead and get you started. Don't worry about that Air Force stuff. Uh, we'll figure something out." And uh, within a month, he had me taking the ASVAB. I got a ninety nine on the ASVAB, and uh, uh, what was that? That was like July of ninety nine, and I was shipped off in October of ninety nine. Okay. Um, I guess, can you describe some of your experiences during a basic training? (laughs) Please, if this sounds like I'm tooting my own horn. Um, In fact, I'll just simply say this is the only time in my military career that I was the best at anything. (laughs) (laughs) So my boot camp instructor told me, oh, excuse me, my recruiter. He said, hey, look, you know, we give this packet to all recruits, study it, learn everything. It'll make um, boot camp really easy for you. So by this time, I'm 23 years old, so I'm hyper motivated. So I learn everything, all of my, you know, ranks, ranks, everything. I learn the, what's that, the, the Navy's, you know, the anchors away, the, the orders of a century. So I am well prepared. And Mm -hmm. like two days before I left, my mom told me something. She says, you're a really smart kid. And I know that you like to question everything. But she said, can you do something for me? I said, yes, ma'am. She said, can you be Forrest Gump? (laughs) 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 I'm like, I I thought I understood what she meant, but I asked, what do you mean by that? 
She said, you've seen Forrest Gump, so can you just do what they tell you to do and not ask any questions? I'm like, okay. <laughs> so be, between knowing everything my recruiter told me and uh, doing what my mom told me to do, I actually graduated as the honor recruit out of like 500 recruits. <laughs> okay. So and, boot camp and where was your was, basic training at or boot camp? Great Lakes, Illinois, or as the Navy likes to call it, Great Mistakes. <laughs> and uh, I, I left October 25th from Houston, nonstop service to Chicago, 45 minute uh, bus ride up to Great Lakes. And that's where all the fun began. So after you finished boot camp, what career field rating did you get? And can you describe generally what that job would entail? Well, you know me, I, I, there's a story with everything. <laughs> I specifically wanted to join the Navy band. I, if I was going to be in the military and if I was going to enlist, I was going to be in the band. And they were like, oh, <laughs> that's not available. Sorry. Based on your score, we're going to get you in the nuclear power field. <laughs> so, <laughs> of course, it wasn't available. So I, I ended up um, becoming a nuclear machinist mate. And actually, I I got I received follow on training to become an engineering laboratory technician. So my specific job on the aircraft carrier. Aircraft carriers have two pressurized water reactors. And the only way that you can, you know, find out if the reactors are working well is that you have to draw water off of the reactor and do analysis on that water. And you also have people that check the radiation levels across the ship and everything. So that was my job. I was a mechanic in name only, but I was mm -hmm. pretty much a uh, <laughs> checking the water. I was a water chemist on board the on on board the carrier I was on. Okay. Can you talk about I guess some of the more challenging things you went through during uh, they call it a school, right? And and so the there's th there's three different there's yeah you you start with the a school that's thirteen weeks. Okay. That's thirteen weeks of just learning like basic mechanic stuff like uh, the air conditioning valves. Um, <laughs> the fundamentals of lubrication. <laughs> so <laughs> serious. An eight hour block instruction on, on lubricating things. And um, so that's the basics. Then six months in nuclear power school. That's where okay. they immerse you in everything, all the theoretical, all the conceptual things on how nuclear power, um, nuclear energy from atoms makes the turbines and the propeller grow roundy, roundy. That's a direct quote. Okay. And then finally, you have another six months where you go to prototype, where there are land-based reactors where you get to practice and qualify on a land-based naval reactor. So, huh. and then I did another 13 weeks after that, which was the engineering laboratory technician. So my first two years in the military was nonstop training. And yeah. to, so is nuclear yeah. for someone who's never, you know, not familiar with that area is, is the nuclear uh, area. Is that one of the more harder areas to be in? So they give you this speech, uh, the day one of the day zero of a nuclear field, a school, they said, welcome to nuclear, the Naval nuclear power pipeline. There are three of the toughest schools in the world. There's MIT, Harvard law, and naval nuclear power you're here <laughs> so <laughs> i will tell people i tell people all the time uh the toughest thing for me was just learning how to study uh five years of college after being a valedictorian i had no study skills whatsoever and i ran into a brick wall the very first exam when i got to be on the, i got to be minus on the first exam mm -hmm. and i had i got a counseling from our our instructor and i'm like what's the big deal i gotta be it's like you don't understand you see question number three you're 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 supposed to answer that question verbatim i said i did i said no you paraphrased it well it means the same thing they're like when we tell you to write something verbatim we mean every comma every word mm -hmm. every period if you don't do that you're violating a direct order so very quickly, I had to learn how to truly study 
internalize information, be able to regurgitate information and spend time learning what I needed to learn. So that mm-hmm. was the big, it wasn't, the material was, was super interesting. It was just the amount and the pace that you had to really spend some time with it. I had some very, very late nights at nuclear power school. And oh, by the way, because all the, uh, all the material is classified, you can't take your books home. So <laughs> at midnight, every night, you lock it up, you go home and you figure it out the next morning if you have an exam. <laughs> So out of, I guess, all the, almost a year and a half or so of training, years. two years of training, mm-hmm. you know, what's the most interesting or funny story that I guess you, you'd be willing to share about your time or your experience? Ooh. Interesting. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I, um, believe it or not, it had nothing to do with, uh, it had nothing to do with the class. It had everything to do with, um interacting with people. I saw you gave me this question and I said, I, I hope this doesn't go outside the scope of what you really wanted, but it was interesting. So at Naval Nuclear Power School, uh, roughly 2000 students there at any given time, I'd say about out of, when I went there in um, the spring of 2000, spring, summer of 2000, there are only maybe about 60 African-American enlisted students, six zero. <laughs> and whenever there was a, uh, whenever dinner, lunch or anything, mostly at lunch, all the, the black students would push their tables together. <laughs> <laughs> and it would be about 20, 25 of them just all congregated together. While me at the time, my best friend was this blonde haired, blue eyed guy from Oregon. <laughs> uh-huh. And I would sit and eat lunch with him every day. I sat with him in new power school. That's, that's my shipmate as we call it, yeah. in the Navy. So one day, um, one day at lunch, you know, everybody's eating and I'm picking up my tray. My friend is already outside. It's a beautiful day outside in South Carolina. And I pass up the table full of black kids and they're like, Hey Mo, man, why, why, why? And I quote, why you always sit with that white guy? <laughs> and it was funny because I'm a little bit older than these guys. They don't realize that I, I have friends of all different races and creeds and everything. And this was more natural for me. Whereas for them, 18, 19 years old, they were just kind of clinging to one another in this scary, scary place. Mm-hmm. And I just looked at him. I said, well, he's my friend. And I kept walking. (laughs) Yeah. The cool thing that happened over time, more people started coming to sit with us. I'm talking about, you know, the redneck from Oklahoma, a couple of guys that were from Brooklyn. They saw that we were having a good time both inside and outside of class. It came to the point where, you know, it just really didn't matter. Folks just wanted to hang out with us. So. I, I realized immediately that my world was never going to be just hang out with the black kids. I was going to always build relationships with uh, diverse groups of people, regardless of if I was in the minority or not. Mm-hmm. So did you, did you, I guess uh, to go back to that, did you, what was your high school pre-military experience where oh. it more segregated uh, <laughs> school oh, oh. or, or more <laughs> no, mixed? I, I, I would no, no. Um, believe it or not, I went to a predominantly African American school. <laughs> I looked it up. It was uh when I went there, ninety seven percent African American, another maybe two percent Hispanic, and I kid you not, the the one percent was Cambodian <laughs> because we had Vietnamese and Cambodian refugees living in the mm-hmm. back of the school, apartment complex in the back of the school. So between going to Worthing High School in the 90s and then going to Texas Southern for two years at a historically black college and university, everything in my world was black and the concerns of African-Americans, the struggle and all that kind of stuff, which is neat. But there's just one problem. Um, I'm what African-Americans call an Oreo. (laughs) And for your, your podcast listeners, the first time I heard that was when I was in sixth grade. 
And I'd never heard it before, but I immediately understood what it meant <laughs> mm-hmm. because, you know, black on the outside, white on the inside, because I had aspirations that weren't with respect to a lot of people to be a rapper, to be a football player. I wanted to do science fair projects. I wanted to f- be in a chess club. I wanted to play clarinet in the marching band, that kind of mm-hmm. deal. So, yeah. When I when I transferred from TSU to the University of Houston, then my world got really big. But it was okay because now I'm dealing with a lot of different people from a lot of walks of life. And I honestly, uh, it was refreshing for me to come to the Navy where there's a lot of different people. So my adjustment was better with people of other races other than African-Americans, because they always looked at me like I was an odd duck. Like, why are you mm-hmm. always hanging out with them? It's like, I, I don't care who I'm hanging out with. I'm just I'm just trying to have a good time and get through yeah. power school. You know, getting back, I guess, to your to your timeline, you, you finished power school mm-hmm. and all your schooling. Um, where was your first duty station after after finishing? Uh, once I finished the pipeline, I went to <laughs> I went to uh, Naval Air Station, uh, North Island in San Diego. This was in November of two thousand one. I was initially supposed to go to um, the Carl Vinson, the USS Carl Vinson CVN seventy seven zero up in Washington State. However, between my wife having my third child. And 9-11, I was, I received new orders to go to the John C. Stennis, which was already at sea. So Mm -hmm. as soon as I got to San Diego, I was probably on the ground there for about three weeks and I was out the door. Um, I actually landed on the John C. Stennis in the Persian Gulf on Christmas Day, 2001. So you were already married uh, before you came into the service? No, I got married roughly a year, yeah, roughly a year after I I okay. served. I pretty much got married right after nu- I finished the nuclear nuclear power school. Just backtracking a little bit, you were still in school when nine eleven happened. Uh, it was it was weird. It was interesting. Um, I had already finished everything. I'd finished the pipeline and everything, but I was held in New York so my wife could have my um, my third child, Amethyst. So they, at the time you, uh, for maternity, after the baby's born, they stabilize you for six weeks, then move on. However, so I had my orders to go to, um, to the Carl Vinson at the time, but as my daughter was born on September 9th, 2001 in upstate New York, Saratoga Springs, that's where the prototype was. I was on September 11th. I was, I had just dropped off my oldest daughter to go to, she was um, starting first grade. I had my son with me. So we were just going to go back to the hospital and go pick up the new bundle of joy, get my daughter from the hospital and everything. And I'm listening to NPR and they're like, we're got some sketchy reports about a, a plane hitting one of the twin towers and what, everything. I'm like, oh, that's weird going to the hospital and my wife, she's holding my baby. She's watching the TV. She said, I just watched a plane hit the other tower. And by the, I mean, and that the rest of that day was just nightmare because they, I lived in Navy housing at the time. They, they did a lockdown on the housing. It was extremely hot that day in upstate New York. (laughs) So we had to park about two blocks away from the house. The baby's upset. I had to go pick up my daughter from school. And you could just imagine the world is upside down. You know, my wife, my wife Mm -hmm. is just laying on the couch. I have the baby just, and I knew that those events would shape the rest of my military career. Because I was supposed to be going to Carl Vinson, which was in dry dock at the time. And it was just going to be, you know, me at the port doing whatever dry, you know, ships in dry dock do. But as soon as I received my orders, 
here I am, I have a three month old baby and I'm going to be leaving my baby. So that was rough right off the bat. Yeah, definitely. So once you get to the, the, the stennis, mm-hmm. can you give a, a, a small glimpse of what life was like for you as a junior enlisted man on the, on the, as a, it was a carrier, correct? Is that what the Yes. Is? Aircraft carrier. Oh man. Um, there was the fantasy of it. And for me, uh, it was awesome. Uh, I landed, we were the night carrier. So when I landed, it was December 25th during the day. So they immediately put me in a 25 man berthing. I slept <laughs> on the top of a of three man bunk. I didn't care because I was just, I was excited to see flight ops that night. Mm-hmm. So, um, as soon as you get on the boat at, even though I was an E5, I was, I was not qualified to work on the plant. So nobody had anything for me to do because for the first week you're, you know, I'm school of the ship where they're just showing you around and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. And even then your nickname is nub November <laughs> uniform Bravo, which stands for non useful body. <laughs> <laughs> so until I was, clear to work in the plant. My job at 06 every morning was to uh, to swab the deck. They call it cleaning stations, sweeper, yep. sweepers, man your brooms. Where does dirt come from in the middle of the ocean? I don't know. <laughs> and I never want to know. But uh, I did the laundry. I, you know, I had to, you know, hump laundry down to the end of the ship. So pretty much any job that needed that that my division, um, reactor, well, we were reactor chemical division, had to do. They needed a body. I was offered up, so I was scrubbing stuff. I was cleaning stuff and everything. It was. Uh, I didn't care. You know, I'm in the military now. That's yeah. what I. That's what I was supposed to do. And in the back of my mind, I had an officer candidate package winding its <laughs> way through. So, I just. Just do what you're told. Just do everything as you're told. It'll work out. <laughs> How long were you uh, in that status before you became qualified to become part of the crew, I guess? So this is interesting. Um, I got on the ship late December. You know, they do work up. They, they do a complete medical workup so you can work in the nuclear portion of the ship. Well, as it turns out, I have... Um, routinely low um, white blood cell count and low platelet counts. Every time mm-hmm. they took my blood, they were just like, ugh, this isn't good. <laughs> and it delayed me. So by, by three weeks, they were just trying to figure it out. They were like, well, we're trying to determine whether we send you back to San Diego or we send you to Launch Stool, Germany to get a full workup. So that was kind of weird because, you know, once you're deployed, after about two or three weeks, some of the homesickness is gone. You're gotten to your battle rhythm. Mm-hmm. But then all of a sudden somebody says, yeah, you know, pack your stuff. You might be going home in about three days. Hmm. And it was like, oh, my goodness. So they actually sent me to launch stool for two weeks. And they did a complete blood workup to include a bone marrow biopsy out of my back. They took yeah. some bone Thanks. marrow out of my spine. It was cool. Get two weeks of Germany, <laughs> all expenses paid. Um, as an E five, I had a, I had a blast. Uh, karaoke every Wednesday night. It was it was fun. Oh, so th- that's where you got that. Uh, <laughs> that's where you learned that, huh? Oh yeah. <laughs> so anyway, I was qualified. I was qualified. They found they just all they did was just re. They found out he is fine. He doesn't have cancer or anything. They just mm-hmm. lowered my. They just lowered my minimums. So that pretty much I was, you know, on a bell curve. I'm always on the low end of platelet clowns and white blood cell count. Okay. I was good. Is that the first time you've ever been out in the ocean? Um, yeah. Outside of a couple <laughs> of ferries, you know, in Galveston, you know, Galveston. Mm-hmm. And, and, I, and I said that in um, nuclear field A school and got laughed out the joint. <laughs> because at the time, the Navy wasn't as... Uh, <laughs> Forgiving when you said words like fairies. Oh, you like to ride fairies, huh? Ha ha. Oh, Lord. Okay. So <laughs> it was my first time. <laughs> it was my first time 
that I had had that remembered that in a long time. But yeah, that was my first time out at sea, and I loved it. All right, it was the outside of being away from my family. I loved being out at sea. It was awesome. So, how long did you stay out on that tour before coming back to the states? So the deployment was five and a half months. About a month before, excuse me, a month and a half before we pulled back into port in San Diego, I got picked up for OCS. But my orders to OCS um, didn't. Um, didn't start until October, 13 October. So we pulled back in in May of 2002 and uh, made it. And I stayed on the ship all the way until October of 2002 before I traveled to Pensacola to start OCS. Okay. You want to talk a little bit about how that went or? OCS? Mm -hmm. or, uh <laughs> So again, child of the 80s, so everything I knew about OCS, officer and a gentleman, right? Mm -hmm. So two things. I knew I was going to get, I was going to drown in the pool because that's what happens in OCS, right? And <laughs> and I was going to have a mean drill instructor. Uh, OCS was the first place where I realized that I wasn't the number one of everything. Well, excuse me. I wasn't going to be the number one officer. So it was just one of those things of make it through. Don't quit, make it through. Don't quit, make it through. So OCS was more about attention to detail. So that was one thing I had to learn really quick. The difference between Navy boot camp, where if you just fold it right, mm -hmm. you're okay. Whereas in Navy OCS, six inches is six inches. You know, having, you know, straight threads on your uniform, you can fail an inspection like that. So I had to really learn how to pay attention to detail. But um, I had a, my drill instructor was awesome. He was the textbook drill instructor. Uh, and in fact, that was the first time I was threatened with my life. <laughs> <laughs> three, three days after they pick you up and everything, you know, he's showing us how to uh, fold our underwear and everything. And, you know, we're all crowded around him. And he says, take seats. And we're supposed to drop to your butt. And with um, crisscross applesauce. Well, I was towards the front, standing right next to him, and I dropped to the I dropped to the floor, and my and my left boot clipped his perfectly shined boot, <laughs> and I I realized I had touched him, <laughs> and he looked down at me. He says, "Candidate, did you touch me?" Uh, yes, sir. <laughs> He says, if you touch me again, I will kill you. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, you know, consider, and it was funny because, you know, here I am. I'm, I'm about 20. I'm 26 years old. 27. That's 2003. So 27 years old. Come from one of the roughest places in the United States. Never been threatened with my life before. So that, <laughs> that was awesome. And uh, but I still made it through. I had a fantastic. Well, I was just really, really happy because now, you know, I'm married now, I'm making almost four times as much as I made before. And uh, things were pretty much looking up for the family. So what branch did you get following OCS? Uh, I was going to be an, a student naval flight officer. I was going to train to be a backseater. Um, that's when, uh, <laughs> that's when stuff started getting really hard because, um, and again, sorry to wax philosophical about all this kind of stuff, but, um, a part of me felt like, uh, I had overachieved just by becoming an officer, a naval officer on top of that. So mm -hmm. to be in Navy flight school vaunted, I mean, Within two weeks of starting, you're you're bam, you're in the cockpit and you're doing you know aileron rolls and all this kind of stuff and man, it's and uh, but I had such a lack of confidence, I never felt like I was supposed to be there. So anytime I struggled, it was like, well, it's just a matter of time before you know they kick me out and all that kind of stuff. So even though I had I was really really good at the ground school. So anytime you had a unit or started a new unit, there was always the academic phase mm -hmm. and then there was the flying phase. 
well, I was always good in academics, could knock that stuff out, but they're, you know, practical phase, 240 knots, flying at 5,000 feet, you know, in, in an ejection seat in Pensacola, and your your pilot, instructor pilots yelling at you, so asking you which way to turn. Mm-hmm. It was a lot. And I had no air sense whatsoever. That is having a sense of where you are in the space. So, and, uh, and by that time, my wife was pregnant with our fourth kid. So it wasn't like I could go home and, um, and just immediately sit down and study. There was taking care of kids, cooking, doing all kinds of stuff. And then 9 30, 10 o'clock at night, start prepping for my flight the next morning. So that was very, very difficult. What prompted you to make the decision to get out of the Navy? Well, <laughs> for the record, I never would have wanted to leave the Navy. Never. So I made it through intermediate, uh, primary and intermediate flight training uh, down in Pensacola. And all I had to do is just get through advance. So went up to the um, BAW 120, which is the E2C Hawkeye Replacement Squadron. Mm-hmm. That's that's your training squadron. That if once you make it through that, you get your wings of gold, and you do a little bit more training, and you're out to the fleet. Well, um, I finally run into an emotional, psychological, and academic. <laughs> Um, brick wall. Um, I realized that if I was going to be in an aircraft, I didn't want to be sitting in the back seat. (laughs) I'd want to fly it. And being in the E2C Hawkeye, being a, what's that, a radar intercept officer, not, it's not radar, air, uh, air intercept officer in the back of one of those things, I was like, this is not what I want to do. And of course, it's difficult. You're learning every system and all that kind of stuff. So I had made it, though, all the way to my last simulator. I was down to one simulator and two flights before I earned my wings of gold. And I failed that check simulator test. I failed it. And uh, they were like, don't worry. It's, you know, you seem to have some um, fundamental stuff that you need to work on. We're going to give you another week and we're going to give you that. You know, give your week and we'll re, uh, re-administer the exam. And by this time, you know, all the rest of my crewmates, they had already started earning their wings. They did their check rides and all that kind of stuff. And I'm like, even if I redo this, redo this simulator, and I go up in the air and I finish this, do I really want to be a backseater? And I said no. So about the next day when they sat me down for my post-failure counseling, I, I dropped on request. And they said, what? Nobody drops on request this close. And I'm like, um, I really don't want to do this. Mm-hmm. I drop on request. And they're like, uh, we, we, you don't want to do this. And I'm like, I don't want, you're right. I don't want to be in the back to the ETC Hawkeye. It's the Navy. I'm already... And O2, just send me out to see. I'll be a surface warfare officer. Mm -hmm. But they hadn't finished uh, trying to convince me to stay. So they had me talk to the senior O6 for all the E2Cs on the East Coast. Mm -hmm. Stood in front of him. He said, I think you're making a mistake. And I was like, no, I don't want to do this anymore. And he said, tell you what, I'll give you a week, take some leave. And we'll get you squared away and we'll get you back into the pipeline. No problem. I said, no, sir. My mind won't change at the end of the week. And he said, okay, heard. And he signed the paper Hmm. and I was out. And were you out of the, were you just out of training or were you out of the Navy? At the time I was out of training. Okay. But as soon as I walked out of his office, I just broke down and cried because I knew that my Naval career was over. I had a, pit in my stomach, even before anything else was said, I knew that that was going to be it. And and at that time, this was um, summer of 2005. 
um, and elsewhere in the world not training, people are fighting and dying for the country and the global war on terrorism. Mm -hmm. And at that particular time, the Navy, uh, the Navy was over strength. In fact, any, any entry level officer that did not complete their entry level training was to be released from the Navy. Hmm. So within, I took two weeks of leave with my family, went to my friend's wedding in Las Vegas. We drove from Virginia to Las Vegas. We had a nice time and we were on our way back. We were going, we were in the middle of Tennessee and I get a phone call from the squadron training officer. Hey Mo, what's going on? That's already a sign. It's normally <laughs> Lieutenant Massacoy. But when they say, hey, Mo, when somebody that you don't talk to on a regular basis calls you your nickname, you know it's a problem. <laughs> yeah, so we have your orders here. I'm like, oh, neat. Yeah, so you're you're being uh you're being released from the Navy. <laughs> <laughs> Wife, four kids in the back. Okay. So yeah, you have 45 days. <laughs> <laughs> to leave the Navy. Oh, and by the way, these orders are two days old. <laughs> oh, yeah. So I'm in the middle of Tennessee. Just burned through a bunch of money. Uh -huh. uh, for <laughs> Just burned through a bunch of money. And now I'm being told that I have uh, less than a month and a half to find what to do with my life. But on the... And I... So I made it back to made it back to Virginia that night, and of course it's Thursday, so I blasted up to work on Friday, <laughs> and <laughs> and I'm reading through the orders. Thank you for your service, however, due to blah 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 blah. I'm like, oh my god, oh my god. <laughs> the very last paragraph of those orders said, however, if you would like to continue your service in the military without a break, call this number and these orders will be suspended while your application to join the United States Army is, <laughs> no is processed. I, I kid you not. So I'm like, and here's the thing. I told you, I, I always wanted to be in the military. I wanted to retire from the military and everything. So it's like, well, I guess this Navy thing is not going to work. <laughs> so, of course, you call the number, and it's the quintessential old lady in, in the white shoes. Hello? Say, yes, this is <laughs> Lieutenant Mascoy. Are you trying to come from the Navy to the Army? Uh, yes, ma'am. You need to fill out this application. Do this, do this. Run it up your chain of command. Let us know when you, re you receive approval. Click. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, there was this really nice um, E6 that worked in our personnel office. She pulled out the regulation worked with me on it and everything. So the process simply was, it was um, the Navy saying, yes, you're, you're approved. We approve you to apply to go into the army. You're not a dirt bag and we will endorse you going into the army if they pick you up. <laughs> so it went all the way up. So it was like, it took about four weeks just for the paperwork to make it all the way to BUPERS, Bureau of Naval Personnel came back and said, yes, you're approved to go apply to the Army. So I called the lady back. Ma'am, this is Lieutenant Bassacoy. I just wanted to let you know I've received approval from there. Now you have to fill out this paperwork and make an application to the Army, and we'll get back to you once we... I was like, yes, ma'am, click. <laughs> <laughs> she was very direct. <laughs> so so uh, that took about another month, and uh, I didn't really... I, I didn't really even get word or anything. It's just that orders just started showing up. <laughs> I got <laughs> orders to Fort uh, Fort Leonard Wood, Missouri. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> oh, that I'm sorry. Backing up a little bit. So a part of the application was uh, which branch in the army do you want to be in? I'm like, mm -hmm. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I used to laugh at the army ROTC kids for dressing up in pickle uniforms, pickle mm -hmm. suits, I used to call them. So I didn't know. So I, I did as much research as I possibly could. I said, well, number one for me was, uh, was intelligence because, you know, that seemed pretty cool. Number two was, was armor because 
they did gas turbine engines. So mm-hmm. I know how to work on gas turbines. That's that's easy. And then chemical, because, ooh, chemical core sounds pretty swoopy. And that's what I did. They deal with radiological stuff. Mm-hmm. My two years of training in that, I'm good with that. <laughs> yeah. So You didn't talk to anyone beforehand, huh? <laughs> no. <laughs> who, who was I going to talk to? <laughs> <laughs> Who was I going to talk to, Gabe? <laughs> so, of course, you know, Chemical Core swooped in on me because <laughs> I won't make any other ethnic jokes, but nobody named Muhammad was going to be an intelligent in, <laughs> in, in military intelligence. And armor, just no. So, can you imagine going from Virginia, you know, <laughs> The coast of the Virginia coast, Mm -hmm. super, super highways and civilization. I had to take an air. I had to take a flight from Virginia um, to St. Louis and then get on a Greyhound bus to get me to St. Robert or St. Joseph, St. Robert's, Missouri, Mm -hmm. then take a cab to get on post. Oh, my gosh. (laughs) <laughs> oh my god i'm like okay that was on sunday before the day before Ch- officer basic course started let's close out your your time in the navy yeah the the main question i would have i guess were there any particular leaders you met during this period in the navy um, that kind of had a long lasting influence on you um <laughs> yes but those there were when I was enlisted. Mm-hmm. When I was enlisted, uh, two of them that come to mind. Um, the first one was Senior Chief Mead Lotz, L O T Z. Um, he helped me through a very difficult time. I was getting ready to quit nuclear power school, and uh, it was—I mean, nuclear prototype. I was almost done. In fact, I'd even told my wife that the, the following morning I was going to. I was going to quit. And uh, Senior Chief Lotz looked at me and said, okay, you've got a family. I know you want to become an officer. This is just something that you have to get through. I said, Roger. Mm-hmm. And uh, then the next person was uh, Paul Spracklin. Paul Spracklin. This one's kind of neat because he was on the Stennis and he was my division officer. He was a, uh, uh, Lieutenant Junior Grade O two, but mm-hmm. he was prior enlisted as well, and he knew that I wanted to. I had an OCS packet pending, and uh, he was like, "He was country." He was like, <laughs> "Okay, okay, Mo, what we're gonna do? I'm, I'm gonna show you some of the life as an officer, what you have to look forward to, and life on the ship is completely segregated between enlisted and officer." But he took me to the officer wardrobe mm-hmm. where they ate. He showed me his birthing. He would talk to me about being a leader. And the day that I left the ship, the day that I left the ship, he he looked at me and said, all right, going to OCS. Don't you come back till you got those wings. You Mm -hmm. hear me? (laughs) And I never spoke to him again until October, until September of 2020. I was getting ready to be, I was getting ready to pin on Lieutenant Colonel Hmm. and I hunted him down. I hunted him down and he was, he was in Korea and I got his phone number and I spoke to him and I, I caught up with him and he says, you know what? I remember you. And he says, I'm super proud of you. Never had a doubt. God bless you. (laughs) (laughs) So those were the, and, and, and I will tell people, and again, not to get too much into social commentary and everything, but both of those gentlemen were Caucasian American. <laughs> As you can imagine, in naval nuclear power, there's not a whole lot of African Americans mentors. Mm-hmm. So the people that helped me, the people that looked out for me, were these gentlemen that saw something in me and helped me along my path. I'm extremely grateful. That's good. 
If you enjoy listening to our show, please take a few moments to leave us a review on Apple Podcasts or your favorite podcast player. This simple step is the best way for you to help new listeners find the show. Join us next time as we continue to share stories from America's military past. And now, a preview from our next episode. I'm an O2, already been an officer for two years, showing up at Fort Leonard Wood. And my first morning, I show up there in a leather jacket, blue jeans, and some boots. <laughs> and I'm here with all oh, these, you, all oh, the, these the top, the top, gu- the top gun uniform, huh? Now, it wasn't even the top. Yeah, I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm just here, man. And of course, you know, you have all of these gold bars, you know, steel pressed creases and everything, locked in berets, all shaved and everything. And here comes the sergeant first class. He comes up to me, where's your uniform? I don't have a uniform. <laughs> where, where are you coming from? United States Navy. Where's your Navy uniform? I'm not in the Navy uniform, I'm not authorized to wear it. You can just see the gears in his brain just grinding. <laughs> and he was like, oh.